afternoon. We have an incredibly exciting guest here today. I am so excited for Sheila Gregoire to be here and to talk with us. Um, so I'm sure many of y'all have been following her. She is steering quiet awakening in evangelical circles and speaking truth that needs to be heard. And I was telling her before she got here that when I first read her book, I just cried because it was so liberating and so freeing, especially if you've grown up in the purity culture. And so today it's going to be a great discussion. We're going to ask a lot of really good questions. So if you're joining us, um, go ahead and drop in the comments if you've read her book or not. Uh, let us know where you're watching from and maybe share this with a friend um, because this is a conversation that's happening a lot, as I'm noticing in mom groups and different places that it, the question we're getting a lot and seeing a lot is, is it really sexual abuse? Is it really sexual coercion? Or is it ignorance? Or is it purity culture? And today we're going to kind of dissect that a little bit mm -hmm. to discern what is sexual abuse and sexual coercion and what is just purely maybe ignorance. Um, so we can answer any questions that you have. So drop them in the comments if you have any questions. So Sheila, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure. Well, it's great to be here. I'm excited to hear what you what you what questions you have, and also just to minister to this group because you guys are doing such awesome work. I'm so excited to partner with you. Um, I have been blogging since 2008, so I started off as a mommy blogger. You know, parenting, marriage, housework, organizing, um, and I was in that space for quite a while. And uh, the more I talked about sex, the more my traffic grew. And so my blog at To Love, Honor, and Vacuum slowly started to morph into more and more sex. Um, my first sex book was out in 2012, The Good Girl's Guide to Great Sex. And I just kept trying to share what I felt was healthy marriage advice. And then over the years, I started realizing that people still had the same issues. And so more recently, in the last few years, I've understood that we can't just share healthy stuff. We need to address the real harmful teachings that have happened in the evangelical church. And that's what the great sex rescue is all about. Wow. Yeah. And it's, it's an amazing book. Yeah. So um, before we turn this on, I was saying that we know that in cases of domestic abuse, that marriage counseling doesn't work. And a lot of times those things that we go to, tried and true things that are going to help marriages, actually makes things worse for victims of domestic abuse. And so it's interesting, as you were uncovering all of this, I think that you found that it's more than just giving unhealthy marriage advice. It's actually setting people up to mm -hmm. be abused. And so that's what I really appreciated about your work. So like, could you talk a little bit about that? There are some very popular marriage books and just the overall um, bad uh, thinking that is causing people to actually, I feel like be groomed for abuse. And so I, I just love that you have spotlighted that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think groomed is the, is the, absolute best term because the, for me, this all started in January, 2019. I had a migraine. I was procrastinating, didn't want to work. And I was on Twitter and people were having this debate as to whether they needed love or respect. And they were referring to Emerson Egrich's best-selling book, the most used marriage curriculum in North American churches. And some of these women were saying, I need respect. And I thought, yeah, so do I. And I realized I, I had that book upstairs, but I'd never read it because I, I have all these books, but I was always so afraid of plagiarizing that I hadn't read them. So I went up and got it and I turned to the sex chapter and I like to explain it. It was like a nuclear bomb went off in my living room. Like I started FaceTiming with my daughter, Rebecca, who was working for me, um, with Joanna Sawatsky, a friend who was working for me. And I'm like, you're not going to believe what he's saying. Because I read, if your husband is typical, he has a need that you don't have. Okay, so sex is just for the man, not for the woman. Um, Emerson Eggers described that that need was for physical release. Nothing mm -hmm. about intimacy. He just needs to ejaculate, okay? And there was nothing, not a single word in that chapter about a woman feeling pleasure. It was just simply, you can't deprive him. You need to understand how much he needs this. And if he doesn't get sexual release, he will come under satanic attack. And so... <laughs> I went a little ballistic and for the next week on the blog, every day I wrote about another harmful thing in love and respect. And over the course of that week, we were inundated with hundreds upon hundreds of direct messages and stories of women for whom that book enabled abuse in their marriage. And 
we created a report. We sent it into Focus on the Family who publishes it. We thought they would listen to us, um, but they totally ignored us. And so we're like, okay, if you can ignore several hundred, can you ignore 20,000? Mm -hmm. And that is why we decided to do, we're like, we're going to go big or go home. <laughs> we're going to do the largest survey of Christian women's marital and sexual Heart satisfaction yes. that has ever been yes. done so that we can figure out the true story. Mm -hmm. I love your feistiness. I love that. That is so awesome. Go big or go home. <laughs> and I can for the head blowing off thing. That's yes. the whole reason this ministry exists. So yes, it is mm -hmm. something that's almost like it's just, it's just right. That is righteous indignation that mm -hmm. we are saying that is not God's way and we're misrepresenting him. And so that's what gets me is that when we misrepresent God, and and then we won't even look look at it and be willing to be humble enough to say we might be wrong about this. Uh, yeah. That's that's been a problem in the church, but we are seeing churches start to wake up. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that is it's so interesting, and I know you probably uh, also highlighted some other ones. Is there, I know that was probably the main one. So any mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, we don't have to mention all the books, but just I'm thinking of other types of scenarios. I think you said you're getting ready to write a new book. Mm -hmm. um, even how youth groups, our youth group culture can set people up for abuse. So, um, yes. We, yeah. We have a book coming out in the spring called she deserves better on how uh, the messaging and youth group can actually set women up for abusive marriages, um, and sexual abuse in, in their teenage years and, and beyond. Um, for this book, what we did was we took the 10 best selling marriage books and six iconic sex books, and we evaluated their teachings because we identified four huge teachings that we found were correlated with worse marriage and sex for women. And then we combed through our bestsellers, evangelicals bestsellers, to see where those messages were. And we found books like Power of a Praying Wife, um, Every Man's Battle, For Women Only, His Needs, Her Needs, like all of these books scored in our harmful category. Um, Active Marriage, uh, yeah, they all scored harmful on our rubric. Because again, they were they were talking about sex as something which was predominantly for him, where she doesn't really have a choice, where it's not about intimacy. She's not the focus at all. It's just something that she gives him. So we've equated, you know, Christian sexuality with male entitlement to women's bodies. Absolutely. 100%. And when it's embedded in the leadership that's really hard mm -hmm. because it's enforced by everybody. It's enforced by those yeah. underneath him as well. And so yeah. a woman out and she doesn't feel like she has a voice to even say anything because nobody believes her and everybody else that has more power is silencing her. And that's yeah. a scary place to be as a woman when you feel you have no voice. Exactly. Yeah. That was a really good quote. We're going to hashtag that. You want to say <laughs> we, have, <laughs> we have equated sexual intimacy Christian to, sexuality with male entitlement to women's bodies. Yeah. That's it. That's wow. We got to, we got to make a, yes, we're going to make a graphic. <laughs> that was powerful. <laughs> I mean, thank you. So, so these are a lot, I have a lot of good questions here that I kind of just like, want to pick your mind and delve in deeper into this. Like let's break this all apart and let's look at what is sexual coercion, but also let's look at what is a healthy sex life look like in a marriage? Because sometimes we can get so focused mm -hmm. on the bad, what, what does the good look like? Because when we understand God's heart and God's intention for it, I think it's so much easier to see when things are wrong because we're like, this isn't right. So a lot of, like, as you mentioned, a lot of Christian teachings tell us to have more sex, to make him happy, satisfy man. But we know that the sex drive is built on so much more than duty sex. Can you talk a little bit about what are the key components should a healthy marriage have? for a healthy sex life. Yeah, I actually think this is so important because one of the main problems, like if we could just get this right, everything else would fall into place, is our definition of sex is totally wrong. Like our definition of sex is Emerson Egrich's, Egrich's definition of sex, which is the male sexual release, okay? Mm. Like if you ask someone, did you have sex last night? What they're picturing is something about, and I hope I can say this, I'm sorry, I tend to be more oh, explicit no. than many people, but, but we tend to picture, you know, penis and vagina, he moves around until he climaxes. Like we're picturing intercourse and we think that is the definition of sex. So as a woman, when you hear that God wants you to have sex in marriage, what you hear is God wants my husband to have intercourse with me. Right. And so what, what is necessary is for intercourse to have the problem is if that is our definition of sex, she could be lying there making a grocery list in her head. She could be in emotional turmoil 
or she could even be being coerced and it would still count as having sex. And so what if we take a huge step back and we say, hold on a second, is intercourse really the biblical definition of sex? Because in Genesis 4, verse 1, the first time inter intercourse or sex is, is specifically mentioned, it says, Adam knew his wife Eve and they conceived a son. And the Hebrew root to that word is the same root as David uses when he says, search me and know me, O God. It is this deep longing for intimacy, this longing to be connected. And I think God used that word to tell us that sex is more than physical. It is a deep intimacy. We know from Song of Solomon that sex is pleasurable for both. She says more words than he does, okay, in that book. So, so we know yeah. that sex is meant to be pleasurable. So we have intimate and we have pleasurable. And then in 1 Corinthians 7, we have a picture of absolute mutuality total mutuality. So sex is something which is mutual, intimate, and pleasurable for both. So if you're just having intercourse, mm -hmm. and if he is coercing you, that doesn't count as having sex. That is not what God intended. When we hear that sex is a gift from God, how many of us think, I wish he would take the gift back? Like, I want, I want gift receipt instead. I hope there's a return policy. Like a yep. lot of us don't actually enjoy it. You know, it hurts. It's awkward. It's uncomfortable. We don't get pleasure or we feel pain or even worse, we're being coerced. What kind of a gift is that? You know, <laughs> and that's the whole problem is that we've seen sex almost entirely from a male perspective and we've missed out on the female perspective, which actually is in scripture, but in yes. the evangelical world, it's been erased. Yeah. Why do you think that is? Like, why do you feel like as a culture, we've erased that? It's like, like erased. Because what, men know? run the church. There's no women in the church. <laughs> I mean, there's women in the church, but none, you know, there's no women at the, at the height of the evangelical church. And it's interesting because if you look back over history at different times, we had very different ideas of women's sexuality. Like in the middle ages, it was assumed she was more sexual than he was. And it was assumed that she couldn't get pregnant unless she had an orgasm. Really? And so, <laughs> there was a lot of emphasis on making sure that women felt pleasure. Um, you know, like we've seen, we've seen women's sexuality very differently throughout the ages. Um, so it isn't something which is just, you know, which is just, he has needs that she doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. I had a, a pastor in um, high school who actually, who is a Hebrew scholar, and he went over the Psalm of Solomon in, in the adult Sunday school class, but I, I would always sit in on the adult Sunday school classes, so I got that message really early on. But then I ended up in very conservative churches, and it, I started getting that very same message that basically I existed for mm -hmm. the glory of the man, like, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, basically misquoting scripture and making it seem like that my my relationship with my husband was almost more important than my relationship with with Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so I, I see that in a lot. Looking back, I stayed in domestic abuse way longer than I should have because of the things that I've been, mm -hmm. I guess, groomed or uh, I had come to believe because of all the reading I'd done. Mm -hmm. Even back then, got out in like 95, we separated 96. I left for good. But, um, even then those, the books were like that. And the, yeah. the thought process was the very much the same that I, that my, my highest goal, uh, goal in life should be to glorify my husband almost. <laughs> if, yeah. if that makes sense. That's just how it seemed. If I if I look back on it, that's how I. See Which it. is really a distortion of, is it the second commandment that you, that you shouldn't put any idols before God, mm -hmm. like, because you're putting your husband in the place of God and we're ignoring first Timothy two, five, which says there is no mediator between God and humanity except for Jesus. And we, in the evangelical church, we have made husbands the mediator for wives because we've told wives the way you follow Jesus is by following your husband. Oh, yeah. Well, then you're not really following your husband. You're, you're not really following Jesus. Yeah. No, not and at so all. We have put Jesus aside and we have put men on the throne and that's actually idolatry. Yep. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that's like, that's our whole heart. We're like, yes, it's all male entitlement. They've been taught that they can get what they want and they can, mm -hmm. they deserve and they're entitled to this. They're entitled to a woman to follow them, entitled to sex on the demand. And it creates, no offense, monsters sometimes. Yeah. They're the worst in evangelical Christian circles. The stories we hear of things that women go through under those who profess Christianity, 
is some of the most God awful stuff. And they feel like the Bible justified all of it. Um, and so where this is leading and ending is not going well. <laughs> so yeah. hopefully it continues to be a shaking and awakening as to where this is heading. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's like you said earlier, they, um, it's, it's creating this mindset. And we were talking about it earlier that perhaps these guys wouldn't even think this way if they hadn't been groomed as well mm -hmm. to be that way. So, I mean, it's, it's really, it's creating mm -hmm. the wrong mindset in both male and female uh, mm -hmm. young people. So I, I think it's just really great that you are highlighting all of this. And it's, I'm really looking forward to seeing mm -hmm. what comes out in your next book. Yes. That would be interesting. Well, what we really tried to do was we wanted to put research to it because people have been arguing about this stuff for decades, but we wanted to be able to say, okay, you can argue about that if you want, but then she'll have a 37% lower chance of orgasm. Like we just thought like, as long as you can yeah. put it in those terms, it's harder to, or, harder to argue, right? But I, I think, you know, in terms of, of how men have been taught, you think about messages like all men struggle with lust. It's every man's battle. You know, mm -hmm. we hear this, everyone hears this, and we've measured how this affects both women and men. We've found that men who believe that have a much harder time with pornography. They have a much harder time getting over porn. Um, if they hear it as teens, they're more likely to start porn. Um, like it's just, it's very destructive all around. Uh, they become more selfish lovers, et cetera, et cetera. And women who believe this lose their libido. Like their libido drops substantially. Um, if they're taught this in high school, even if they don't believe it, if they're merely taught it, it lowers their trust in their future husbands, even if they haven't met their husbands yet. Um, it makes it makes you have sex more often just because you feel like you have to. It's just a really destructive message. But if you think about how this is also framed, like every man's battle literally told women that you are the methadone for your husband's sex addictions. You know, when he quits cold turkey, be like a merciful vial of methadone for him. Yeah. Yeah. It's awful what that does and how the view that gives a woman. And sadly, a lot of men who are abusive use that as a weapon. They're and like, they if do. you don't give me what I want, then I will be so tempted to look at porn because mm -hmm. you didn't do what I said and you didn't have sex on demand here or you don't um, dress in a way that's sexy enough for me, then I'm going to be tempted to go look at other women because I need this. And well, we yeah. taught them that. I let me and let me just give you a bunch of quotes because like this yeah. I get I get really fired up it. on this one. Okay, so yes. Gary Thomas and Deborah Felita in a book that um, was written after Great Sex Rescue came out. So this was just written last year. Okay. okay. Um, and he had already read Great Sex Rescue. So he knew what our survey results found. He said that he praised women who texted naked photos to their husbands because then neurologically their husbands would be attracted to their bodies and would turn towards their bodies instead of other women's bodies. Can you imagine? That's like, yeah, that's Mark Driscoll. Whenever he said he would see a, porno, a naked woman on the front of a cover of a magazine, he would immediately picture his wife over there so that he could visualize her in his place. Yeah. So, yeah. oh yes. And then so these evangelical, evangelical men demand these nude photos, nude photos, excuse mm -hmm. me. I am fired up too. And then not only that, there are I read one thing recently how their husbands say, well, I can look at porn. Look at this. I just visualize you in the place. You're mm -hmm. my porn for me. And that's not okay. That's not God's heart. It's terrible. Well, what it's really saying is that um, the goal of male sexuality is to stop objectifying all other women and just objectify one woman. Mm. And it's like, no. The heart of sexuality is that we truly know each other and treat each other as human beings made in the image of God. Not that we objectify or use each other. <laughs> and yet, you know, that's what Gary Thomas was arguing. And he was using, you know, faulty neuroscience research to talk about how men can't help it and they need this. I mean, um, uh, Kevin Lehman and Sheet Music talked about how uh, a woman's period is a really difficult time for her husband. <laughs> yes. Yes. And so um, this woman learned that if she gave oral sex during her period, he'd be less likely to look at porn. Wow. And these are the kinds of messages that we are inundated with and nobody said anything or if they did they weren't listened i know many people were speaking up but they just weren't listened to but that that's another message that we measured that was really harmful was women should have frequent sex with their husbands to keep them from watching porn and we see it throughout our literature and it is so damaging and it's also not true yeah. <laughs> you know you don't defeat porn by becoming porn um and, and if he has an objectified, pornified view of relating to women, having more sex to defeat that isn't the answer because it reinforces it. Yes. 
And it's not just sex they do that with. So what we find even with victims of abuse, when they go in for counseling, then submit more, uh, go home and cook his favorite meal. Mm -hmm. uh, house clean. But we kind of um, basically reduce it to pray, stay and obey. Those are the yes. kinds of uh, tips they get when they go in for counseling. And a lot of them will go to their churches first. But even Christian counselors, we've heard, give that kind of advice. Like they put the... Mm -hmm burden for the abuse on the woman. And it's the same thing here. We're putting the whole burden for his behavior on her instead of him. So he's no longer responsible and accountable to God for him, his own actions. Right, because he can't help it because men were made with such an insatiable need for sex. And and they use the verses in 1 Corinthians 7, the do not deprive verses, to say that you are not allowed to say no. And in fact, um, withholding and demanding. I've heard pastors say those are both equal sins. Well, they're not equal sins. Okay. Raping your wife is worse <laughs> than not raping someone. Okay. Like, but, it is. but yes, but this I'm idea just... that, that you can't <laughs> say no and that we, we, we must always have sex or else our marriage is in trouble is simply wrong. I, I remember watching a panel where there were some extremely big name Christian authors on that panel. And the question was asked, you know, if he's caught in unrepentant porn use and you're trying to hold him accountable, is it okay to take a sex hiatus? And the result, and the, the answer is, well, you really can't because the Bible says not to deprive him. And it's like, no. You're totally misreading it. But you see, that's what you come to when you see sex as only intercourse. When you understand that sex is something mutual, intimate, and pleasurable for both, then of course you can say no because you weren't really having sex in the first place. She was already being deprived because she didn't experience real intimacy because he mm -hmm. was using porn. So he's not yes. the one being deprived. She was already being deprived. And this is just putting things right. Yes. There's a question there. It says, um, who is going to address the false ideas of men who are saying this? Well, Sheila. Yeah. <laughs> She's already doing it. You have to follow her at um, her Facebook page. It's really awesome. I love watching all of the books that you tear apart and you highlight them. I'm like, yes. <laughs> yes, I do a number of fixed it for you on Instagram and, and Facebook at Bear Marriage. So you can check out Sheila Gregoire on Instagram or Bear Marriage. And um, yes, I like to take people apart. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yes. And it's so validating for us women who've been through that in sexual coercion and abuse in marriage. And I just want to talk about that for a moment, too, of how does that affect a woman's sex life? Um, because what happens a lot of times when he starts, as you're mentioning, demanding sex, um, threatening her if she doesn't give him what he wants. We've heard stories of women. If she says, no, I'm too tired, he'll threaten to beat her or threaten mm -hmm. to leave her. Look at porn. And there's all types of stuff. And that greatly impacts a woman. And that mm -hmm. greatly her to not be able to respond to him sexually, which causes an increase in sexual abuse and sexual coercion because he feels more and more entitled. Can mm -hmm. we kind of delve into that a little bit? Like, how is it that sexual coercion effect or sexual demanding affects her sex libido? Because um, a lot of women feel guilty. Like, they're told you're not having enough sex. Well, they don't desire to have sex with him because he's mm -hmm. abusive and yeah. he's selfish yeah. and he's demanding. So can we just alleviate some of that guilt for women that are maybe watching the scene. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, your body is very connected to everything else that is happening to you. And your libido, it, libido is a sign that you're safe. Okay. When you feel safe, then you're going to want to have sex. When you don't, you're not going to want to have intercourse because women's bodies, we can get pregnant. All right. And so we were made so that when you don't feel safe, when you feel stressed, your libido goes way down because your body is saying, wait a minute, now is not a good time to get pregnant. Okay. So if we ever feel unsafe, our libido is going to tank. And that isn't our fault. That is a natural, logical, correct, God-given response to the situation that we are in. And we need to start understanding that coercion makes us feel fundamentally unsafe because if sex is supposed to be a deep knowing, and now we teach her that she is obligated to give him sex when he wants it. Suddenly sex is not a knowing. It's actually a rejection of you as a person. Because if she is obligated to give him sex, then what we're really saying is that her needs and her wants do not matter. And you can't have intimacy if her needs and wants don't matter because you're erasing her. And so obligation 
and coercion erase her as a person, which makes us fundamentally feel unsafe. That is almost the, the well, basically it is the definition of trauma when, when you're erased. Um, mm -hmm. And so many of us are going through trauma and we may not realize it because mm -hmm. we're taught this is just what a Christian marriage is, but mm -hmm. it's not. If you feel like you can't say no, then you can't truly say yes. Some really good one-liners in there. Yes, I'm gonna let that. <laughs> and uh, yeah, Diana says it sounds awfully like coercive, co coercive control, and definitely is what I was saying earlier, Diana. That um, basically we're putting the entire burden on usually the woman uh, mm -hmm. because of the way that we teach things in evangelical circles. And so I really am so grateful for your work and that you are. Um, trying to sh shine a light on this. And I'm really sad that people aren't necessarily listening. Um, but I think that give it more time, they will. Because what we've seen with coercive control is within churches, when I first started doing this work, they really didn't think that it was a problem. And so um, I always tell people it's kind of like, I, I personally consider myself, I come alongside, I'm willing to work with churches and we will help them. And I think that's really what we're trying to do here. We're not trying to attack the churches. We're not trying mm -hmm. to attack men. We're just saying this isn't the way, this isn't God's heart mm -hmm. for, for women. It's not even God's heart for men to turn them mm -hmm. into tyrants. Uh, this, is, this is basically just false teaching that is hurting marriages. And if you want to save marriages, then do it the right way. Yep. Yep. You got another question there? Yes, I do. Um, so let's talk a little bit more specifically since we're being asked about sexual coercion. What does it exactly look like? And we talked about its effects on marriage, but can we maybe get, like maybe a woman's watching this and she's not really sure if this mm -hmm. is sexual coercion. Um, we know kind of like about the entitlement, how they're taught, or is this just he's ignorant? Can we kind of go into that a little bit? Yeah. So sexual coercion is any time that you have sex in order to prevent something bad from happening. So if you have to have sex in order, like for instance, I, I had an email from a woman who said, um, I need to have sex every week before small group, because if I don't, he'll embarrass me at small group. Or I need to have sex before we go to the beach, because if I don't, he'll just be terrible with the kids and we won't enjoy it as a family. Like if you have to have sex to manage his moods or to prevent him from embarrassing you or um, being terrible with the children, that is coercion. If you have to have sex um, in order to pacify him, you know, so that he doesn't yell at you or act abusively, that's coercion. If you have to have sex because he's quoting Bible verses at you and he's preaching, he's telling you that you're a terrible wife and you don't love Jesus and you need to submit more, that is spiritual abuse and that is coercion. Sex is supposed to be something which flows out. If Sex is the culmination of a healthy marriage relationship. It is a culmination mm -hmm. of the emotional connection that you already feel, and it is now expressed physically. But sex in the absence of emotional connection will tend to make you feel even less connected and will pull you even further apart. You know, I think it was about 20% of our survey respondents said their primary emotion after having sex was feeling used. And that's not okay. And then there's a group of women. It's interesting because if you look at our results, um, basically, uh, if you look at how marital satisfaction correlates to the frequency of how often you make love, there's a big jump up at once a week. Okay. So having sex at least once a week is a lot better than like three times a month. There's a huge jump. And then there's like some minor jumps to two or three times a week. It gets a little bit better and a little bit better. But then you get to the people who have sex daily and it drops off. Because usually when people are having sex daily, that is an abusive relationship and she's being used. If they're having, okay, can you repeat that again? Because I have recently just written a story about a woman whose husband was having an affair and told her she wasn't having sex, but they were having sex every day. Mm -hmm. So I'm hearing it's quite common. They're appeasing him by having sex two times a day, once a day. And if they don't, they will be abused. So can yeah. you just repeat what I said again? Because I is powerful. Yeah. So, you know, again, so, so having sex more frequently tends to help your marriage unless you're having sex daily, because people who have sex daily overwhelmingly 
are more likely to be in abusive marriages because most people don't have sex daily because life gets in the way. <laughs> and sometimes you're, even if you have a really high sex drive, even if you have an awesome marriage, very few people have sex daily. So the people who are having sex daily tend to be people who are married to a sexually abusive spouse, a sex addict, and who is demanding something that she feels she has to supply. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that because I feel like sometimes in evangelical circles, those women are like the goddess. Do you know what I mean? Like they're like, oh, my wife has sex with me every day and that's considered the way to be, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But from thing and what I'm hearing from women stories that I'm writing, it's very common that, that, that there is a sexual addiction happening yeah. and she's being sexually abused when there is sex every day. And let's remember too that our books, our evangelical books, tell women that they need to do this even during their periods or the postpartum phase. Like, you know, Kevin Lehman in Sheet Music incur it says that, you know, when when you're um, postpartum or if your periods are heavier than usual, you can give them a hand job. Right. Um, Gary Thomas in his book Married Sex that I already talked about talks about how uh, men women give ex get excited giving hand jobs postpartum. Like they describe a hand job where she's just getting so turned on. And you know what some women do, and I don't mean to diminish that, but to set up the expectation that this is normal, that right after she's had a baby, her primary or one of the primary things she's going to make sure of is that he doesn't um, lose his number of ejaculations is very problematic. Um, Intended for Pleasure said that uh, in the period of abstention after the birth, she should make sure that he gets sexual release to the same frequency as he did before. So we're telling women that at the most vulnerable time of your life, when you're not sleeping, when your body has just gone through something very traumatic, when you've got so many hormones going through you, you have to stay sexually available in the same way to your husband as you were before. And you have to give him sexual favors since you can't give him intercourse. And that is, I, I think that is an example of spiritual abuse from our books. And then when you wow. translate that into marriage, it becomes really abusive. But interestingly, and this is something you were, you were talking about, not all men are abusive who follow this because a mm -hmm. lot of men were just taught this is what godly marriages are. And so if mm -hmm. my wife doesn't want sex, then we don't have a godly marriage. And so we need to do this more to have a godly marriage. And what's wrong with her? Doesn't she get with the program? And I have heard so many stories from couples where they read Great Sex Rescue together and he was just broken because he never realized what he was doing. And that's the real key, I think, is when you start to talk to your husband about mutual, intimate, pleasurable for both, you know, and is sex like that for us? And is it okay for you to get pleasure from something that causes me pain? Is that something mm -hmm. that's a good thing? And when he starts to realize, no, I would never want that. Oh my gosh, how have I been acting? So many men are completely broken. They're totally repentant and they want to rebuild. But then there's those that aren't. And that's really the key is when they see the truth, how do they respond? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's what we find in, in even when it comes to domestic abuse, coercive control, um, it's whether or not they're willing to see themselves and to be humble enough to admit something mm -hmm. is wrong. And so um, there's pride and entitlement behind the ones who continue down that path of destruction, right? So the sexual abuse and domestic abuse, both, there is just this attitude of entitlement that, that they, they're not willing to let go of. Mm -hmm. And then there's a group of men that might be acting in the same way, like demanding sex and wanting sex a lot that aren't entitled. They just feel very helpless because they've been taught that their sex drives are insatiable, that they're automatically going to lust after other women, that they're going to want to watch porn and their wife is their only um, approved sexual outlet and their wife is their only way to fight against sin. And so if he doesn't use her, he's going to sin. And so he's using her in order to obey God. <laughs> and it's so twisted and it's so disgusting, but that's also what they've been taught. And so when, when these men can take a huge step back and realize, hold on a second, finding other women attractive does not mean I'm in sin. You know, <laughs> having a stray sexual thought does not mean I'm in sin. Um, when they can realize that and back up and say, no, what's really a sin is when I objectify my wife, then that, mm -hmm. then you can see a lot of healing happen. Yeah. Wow. That's yeah. Spot on. Abusive men are typically people. They do what they do because it gets them what they want. And so mm -hmm. when a man's 
and willing to step back and look at this, what would you say to somebody who's caught a marriage, is caught in that situation? What is best for them to do to pursue healing? Um, yeah, um, I think it's very, very important. Um, if you feel like you are being sexually coerced, just to say no to sex. Seriously, just say, no, I do not feel safe. And I would like to take 60 days off of sex, 90 days off of sex, three weeks off of sex, however long, like put a time period on it while we see a licensed counselor and we work through what sex should look like in our marriage. And if he is not willing to take that sexual hiatus, that is a red flag that the marriage is abusive because for women to truly heal from sexual coercion, they need to know that they can say no without him becoming angry, becoming grumpy, becoming not able to work, um, becoming mean to the kids. Like they need to see that he can be a decent human being, even if I don't have sex. Because if the only thing making him a decent human being is me having sex, that is a problem. <laughs> and so yes. for her to feel that I am not obligated, the only way for that to happen is some is for there to be a sex hiatus. And so, you know, obviously conversations would come first. It could be that he's repentant, you know, and, and he really does, he really does change, but most women need a period of time where they can see, no, he's, he is going to be okay. And if he won't give you that time, that is a red flag that there's coercion, real coercion and a real problem in your marriage. And sadly in domestic abuse, when she tells him no and says no to sex, that's when violence can really yes. escalate. Yes. So if you're suspecting that you really are truly in a domestically abusive marriage, we have watched this firsthand, mm -hmm. please reach out and get an advocate or somebody that's willing to walk with you because yes. you may need an escape plan. Um, because if you tell him no to sex, there is men that will get very violent. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And that can be very scary um, yeah. for the woman's safety. Yeah. And uh, we see a couple of women, one made a, a comment about being triggered. And yes, we need to put a trigger warning over this. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I say stuff and then I forget. Oh, no, it's fine. It needs to come out. It's all of us. We're healing. Things are triggering, you know, but like the way to heal is to walk into that. Every time you face a trigger and you overcome, that's further along in your healing that you mm -hmm. are. And the truth hurts. And it's, mm -hmm. it, it's, there's feelings inside we haven't dealt with, but it's okay to feel those things, walk away and seek Jesus and come back when you're ready. So yes. and Veronica's saying, what if you're afraid to have that conversation with your spouse? And then Lauren was just talking about that. If you feel endangered by saying no or having that conversation, then um, it would be really wise to, again, have a safety plan in place, talk to somebody, an advocate through Call to Peace Ministries. I would recommend Leslie Vernick's books on um, how to stand up to someone, but she, she also talks about staying safe when you do have those conversations. So the emotionally mm -hmm. abusive marriage um, and the emotionally abusive relationship are a couple of her books. Um, definitely, she has a, she talks a lot about how you can do that, um, but it's definitely carefully, very carefully. Yes. You're not going to just go out and blurt it. We tell people all the time, you have to be so careful when somebody's truly abusive. I, I, we recommend women who are in danger and we know that it's truly abusive. We have something we call a lethality index so we can see how dangerous your marriage might be. Mm -hmm. And if you're high on the lethality index, what we will do is say, we don't tell them you're leaving. You just leave. So, yeah. because again, there's just, it just depends on the amount of danger that you're in as to how you will handle it. So mm -hmm. just be really, if you want to connect with one of our advocates, reach out to us. Mm -hmm. Um, Yes. And also I wanted to talk to the women here as we're talking about triggers and things like that is I do believe God has redemption for us. Even if that doesn't mean you're, you're single and it's obviously the marriage is not redeemable, but how can you redeem your sex life as a single? Like what are some ways you can begin healing to view yourself as God does and to view sex as God does? Because a lot of times we just shut that area off and that's mm -hmm. not healthy. It's good to go down and face those lies that we believed and learn how God views this because until we see the reality, we can't grieve it. And unless you grieve it, you can't move forward. So I don't know. I'm just kind of curious. Maybe you have some ideas of things that can just kind of help women find healing and redemption in that area. Yeah. One of the things I was so surprised at, we, we thought Great Sex Rescue was a book for married couples. And <laughs> there's been such a huge number of divorced women who have read it, um, singles who have read it, because I think we just need healthy teaching in this area. One of the big things I say to women who are escaping abusive marriages uh, or looking on the other side of divorce back at their marriage 
is that one of the most healing things you can understand is that God was not your pimp. Hmm. Because I think a lot of us feel at our most used when we felt like we were being coerced, like what we wanted didn't matter. He was using us for his own pleasure and it was causing us physical and emotional pain. We felt like it was God that was doing that to us because we weren't allowed to say no or we would be in sin. And so it wasn't just that he was using us. It was that God was telling us that our husband was doing the right thing, that this was our husband's right. And we were the ones who were in sin by being upset about it. And it really makes you feel like it's not just that your husband's being coercive, but that God was coercing you too. And that is just such a, the one safe place you're supposed to have has been stolen from you when you see mm-hmm. God that way, right? God was supposed to be your safe place to help you get out of abuse. And instead it felt like he was part of the one perpetrating it. Mm-hmm. And so I think one of the ways to redeem our sexuality is just to recognize that God was upset with that too. And that that was never his intention and that this teaching was never of him. And so you, you do have dignity and you do have worth and he didn't want you to be used. And I think that recognition that what happened to me was not God ordained. It truly was abuse. Even if it didn't look like your husband holding you down physically, um, even if it didn't, you know, even if you weren't kicking and screaming, it still was coercive and it wasn't from God. Yes, absolutely. That's what I love about your work so much is that you're actually introducing people to God's heart again. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the things that we have to have happen if we're going to heal after any kind of abuse. And to sexual coercion, coercion in my mind is abuse. Even, you know, we might not want to go in so far as to call it rape or whatever, but it's abuse. And so um, understanding that it's not God's heart for you is so important. And mm-hmm. we're really grateful for that. Yes. Regard. Thank you so much for coming to speak to that. That was truly healing and just beautiful what you shared there. Um, like I was saying, is just understanding God's heart. Because so many times if that's been used as a weapon against you, you begin to see God as a monster that's standing mm-hmm. over you. Literally, you feel like God created sex to abuse you. And when we shut that part of our heart off and we believe that lie, we're shutting that part of our heart off to God. And we want God's love of our lives in all the fullness of our hearts. So thank you for sharing that. It was absolutely beautiful. I just, I loved it. And like I said, your book is just, was incredibly healing to me. Um, Like I mentioned earlier, I read through the whole thing and just cried because it was so validating and so healing to see God's heart and to see what he truly created sex to be. So anybody watching this, I highly recommend um, Sheila Gregoire's book. Um, and we'll link it in here. Um, do read it. It's excellent. Um, you've done such a great job. So thank you yeah. for all that you do to advocate for women and yeah. for joining us today. <laughs> the Great Sex Rescue. And what's the new one that's going to be coming out called? Uh, she Deserves Better is out in April for moms okay. of daughters. When you don't want your daughter to be to grow up the same way that you did and you want better relationships for her, then this is how to steer clear. Because there are just a lot of churches that are teaching the wrong stuff. Yes, yes. absolutely. Yeah, I don't see my daughter for youth group. Yeah. I, mean, I probably shouldn't say that. Out loud, People but. perish for lack of knowledge. And we're so grateful that you're giving them <laughs> the knowledge to uh, hopefully run from that <laughs> perishing. And then one more quick comment. I know women in the church who have actually said it's not possible to be raped within marriage. I've heard that because of the right of a body in First Corinthians 7, but that is not what it means. And I totally agree with you. It's a mutuality thing. The yeah, can, I just, can I just talk about First Corinthians 7 for a minute? Go Please right go right ahead. Yes. Okay. So First Corinthians 7, 3 to 5 says this. Um, uh, the husband must fulfill his marital duties to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. And the wife's body does not belong to her alone, but also to the husband. And the husband's body does not belong to him alone, but also to the wife. And do not deprive each other except by mutual consent and for a time that you may devote yourselves to prayer and fasting, but then come together again so that you won't be tempted by your lack of self-control. Those verses 
have been weaponized so much against women and every heart restored, which is part of the every man's battle series. They say that husbands are guaranteed sexual release in first Corinthians seven in the same way that women are guaranteed honor in first Peter three. And I'm thinking, honey, if you think husbands are guaranteed sexual release in first Corinthians seven, then so are wives because it's totally mutual. So let's just deconstruct yes. this for a minute. So again, sex is something which is mutual, pleasurable, intimate for both. So when they're talking about do not deprive each other, they're not saying don't deprive of sexual intercourse. They're saying don't deprive of true sexual intimacy. Mm. Let me tell you something. Women are the most deprived. The women in the yes. pews are massively deprived. We have a 47 point orgasm gap in the church, by which I mean that 95% of men almost always or always reach orgasm in a sexual encounter and only 48% of women do. So we have a 47 point orgasm gap in the church. But also mm -hmm. if you feel used, if he's watching porn and he has a pornified style of relating, you're being deprived because it's not intimate. And so <laughs> like this whole idea that you are depriving him by not giving him an orgasm, by not giving him release in some way, honey, <laughs> women are the ones who are most likely to be deprived. But also if we look at the social context of those verses, they were written at a time when men had total authority over their wives' bodies to the extent that husbands could murder their wives and it would be okay. And Paul writes into that context, because everybody would have remembered this, everybody would have known this. He said in the same way. So the wife's body belongs to the husband. And everyone's like, yeah, well, I know, obviously. But he, then he says, in the same way. That was the revolutionary part, that the wife had authority over the husband's body. And in fact, in the Greek, the only place in the Bible where authority in marriage is explicitly talked about is these passages, and it's totally mutual. Mm -hmm. Wow. So the wife has authority over the husband's body. That was the revolutionary part. And yet we have totally forgotten that. And we have used these verses to weaponize against women. Um, and also, if you look further in the chapter, we see what Paul is really addressing. At the time, what was going on in, in Corinth was that the new believers were thinking that the holiest thing they could do was to be celibate. And so people were, were promising to be celibate, even people who were married. And Paul was saying, wait a minute, you're not supposed to be celibate. So he wasn't saying that sex needs to be every day or frequently. I read an article in the Gospel Coalition recently that says that 1 Corinthians 7 says that you're supposed to have sex every few days, that it spells it out. Oh. No, it doesn't. No, what's okay. Paul is simply arguing that you're not supposed to be celibate, but we don't see any, like, it, it's all up to the individual couple how often you have sex, okay? <laughs> um, but then everyone always quotes 1 Corinthians 7, 3 to 5. Do you know what verse 6 is? No one knows what verse six is. I you say this, I say this as a concession, not a command. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's never talked about. No, all this stuff. And, 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 you know, you can argue that verse six is supposed to go to verse seven, like, like that it's not supposed to refer to those, but in the Greek, it is all one complete thought. And so all of the stuff that he has been saying, it's a concession to them, not a command. Okay. Wow. And yet we take it as the do not deprive is the absolute command. Um, Daniel Aiken, who's the president of Southeastern Baptist Seminary, I believe, in um, the study notes for the Holman uh, Christian Standard Bible that he wrote the study notes for that. He says that um, 1 Corinthians 7 tells women that they must satisfy their husbands sexually. But he never says that it also says that to husbands. Hmm. Everything that is said to women is also said to men. And yet we have made those verses only about what women are supposed to do sexually. We're missing the whole point. And, wow. and next time someone quotes that at you, say, I've already been deprived. So those verses don't even apply to me. <laughs> yeah. So one quick question. Um, Katina is asking, can you explain what authority over each other's bodies is supposed to mean? I think I, I, in the context of it, Again, what Paul was just saying is, look, you're not allowed to say to someone, you can't have access to my body ever. Because again, they, these people were pledging celibacy, okay? But you need to understand that all of scripture is used to interpret scripture. So we can't just take one verse and say, we know what this verse means because we've read this one verse. This one verse has to match and has to be interpreted with everything else that it says in scripture. So what else does Paul say? 
Paul also says that we are to have the same mind that is in Christ Jesus, who did not mm -hmm. consider equality with God something to be grasped, but gave him gave um, up everything and made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant. And that's what we're supposed to do. So when you interpret those verses, you need to see it in those same lines. We need to see it in the words of Jesus, who said that we are to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Mm -hmm. And and so we can't take these verses in isolation, which is what has been done. Um, and also, if you have authority over your husband's body, that also means that you can say, you don't get to use your body on mine right now. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yes. Like the whole point of that passage is not that he has authority over your body. It's that everything is mutual. And what Paul was really arguing about was that the husband does not have authority over the wife's body that she doesn't also have. That's what he was trying to correct. Because right now everybody already, already thought the husband had authority over the wife's body. The actual, the act, what Paul is really looking at is in verse three, that you're supposed to fulfill each other's sexual desires. And the wives are mentioned first. The husband wow. must fulfill this, his, his marital duty or his sexual needs to the wife. Okay. The wife's needs are mentioned first. And then he starts saying, then he starts dis, dis, dismantling this idea that the husbands have authority over the wife's body in a way that she doesn't. And he just makes everything equal. And that's mm -hmm. the point of that passage. Yeah. So, and then you go on down in First Corinthians 7 and it talks about an unbeliever departing. And that was a verse that was a sticking point for me because my husband said he was a believer and he mm -hmm. didn't want to leave. And then I went down and I read the heart behind it, that in such cases, the believing spouse is not under bondage because God has called us to peace. And it mm -hmm. washed all over me. I haven't had peace mm -hmm. in 23 years. God's heart for us is never to put us in turmoil, oppression, uh, mm -hmm. that is just not art for us. And so uh, it has helped me a whole lot as I read scripture to look for his heart instead of the letter of the law. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. I think that as you're reading through passages like this, you look for his heart in this. And I totally agree that th there is a heart of mutuality and equality even behind this, uh, because it is supposed to be, you cannot have an intimate relationship with just one person. Yeah. It takes two people. And so it's two people who are involved and know each other in, on an intimate level. And so I just love um, that you're bringing all of this out. It's, it's beautiful. And um, we're very grateful for you and your work. Thank yes. you. Great. Thank you for helping emulate the heart of God today um, through his design for sex. So thank you for talking with us. And I know it was very beneficial to a lot of our ladies and we plan on continuing to share this with more people. So thank you so much. You're so welcome. It's good to be here. Yes. Right. Well, everybody have a good day. And if you'll have any further questions, um, let us know and we'll try to answer them. And we will be dropping a link to your book in the comments too. So awesome. check out her book. Thank you. Thank you. Thank okay. you, Sheila. Thanks.